very pleased to introduce a very good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Tanner Haight, who is part of Cotton Incorporated. Uh, he's the Vice President for Agriculture and Environmental Research at Cotton Incorporated. If you don't know anything about Cotton Incorporated, you probably know one of the famous slogans. It is, Cotton, the fabric of our lives. And that's where it comes from. And so, Tanner's going to kick us off really talking about the, the hands-on, boots-on about issues of agriculture, this kind of climate, and dealing with climate variability, and how do you really work with people that are actually trying to take what we do as science and make it part of the reality, and how, what kind of outcomes we expect. So, Kate, we're glad to be here. Thank you, Thanks John. very much. Appreciate it. I really appreciate the opportunity to visit with you, particularly during those great introductions. I have two children that are your age, all of your age, and so I'll offer my one which unique about me, is I do an outstanding job of balancing structured work and non-structured work for another side, right? And I do that because I love what I do. And so it makes it real easy. It's just a continuum. And so anytime I'm not doing structured work, I'm either with family, I'm with family, I'm with family, or I'm working out at the gym because my wife sleeps in, or we're going hiking with family. So uh, I do a, a, I handle that well. But the secret is to really love what you're doing, and it's just one big continuum. You don't worry about it. So let me um, let me take the opportunity to to oops, not turn this off. Oh, there we go. Um, to not turn this off but tell you just a little bit about my background, so at the end you can decide, boy, I really don't want to go down that path. <laughs> and because uh, I have done something uh, unique within an academic environment, I've been a revolving door. I've gone in and out between industry and uh, university or public, public service uh, over time. So just a little bit on that, um, I have uh, two, under, two uh, degrees from UC Davis, uh, I want to be a plant breeder, but I have this, who was color challenged? Um, one of you was, was vision challenged and, and, and couldn't be uh, an astronomer. Um, I'm color challenged, red, green, I want to be a plant breeder, and so I just couldn't, couldn't do it, I realized that, but I studied barley, and then I, got to, um, I did a, a transition jobs for one year each, working a wide variety of crops, including for the Gallo family, uh, managing uh, grapes and alfalfa on, on way too much acreage. And then I got into a, a university environment where I worked, I was a cotton extension specialist, worked citrus and grapes and, and cotton, so I keep adding to my litany of crops. So the first take home message is to get that diversity of agriculture, um, because the really neat things are what cotton does and citrus does, or grapes do, that almonds don't, and look for those kind of things. We get so siloed into the way cotton does it. And unfortunately, this is going to be a, a set cotton-centric presentation. Um, but feel free to ask about any aspects of agriculture. I did it, did it for close to close to 40 years. Um, so I left the extension service after after nine months, and I have done a, a really good job of getting lots of extension publications. And so that was the tech, second take-home message. I did everything possible, not knowing that it was the right thing to do to expand my reputation and visibility beyond the little area I was responsible for. And so I was asked to start a, a new uh, producer education program called Cotton Physiology Education Program. Uh, it was a half million dollar uh, funded program. We built a newsletter, monthly newsletter, uh, up to 17,000 mail outs based on request only. So uh, growers loved it. And, and it was very successful. And then I came to love it because I really loved the extension. I really wanted to be a state extension specialist. That's sort of the pinnacle of extension. And if you're in cotton, having that position in Texas is, is the pinnacle. So I came here, um, did that for four years, and loved it. Really, the growers here, as you'll see a lot of pictures of them, are just really neat, salt of the earth people, just brutally honest. Because their environment's really obvious to them. And then I um, I started doing a little things in, in international. I learned to really like international uh, agriculturalists. You know, 
when you go overseas to uh, a foreign country, those people that, that fall into agriculture are just the most giving people available. They're just incredibly um, society oriented. We want to get, you know, if you're in, in some of these countries and you're, you're focused on, on personal wealth, you don't go into agriculture. So the ones that make a choice to go into agriculture really want to make a contribution. So that was a really exciting. So I had an opportunity to go work for a, uh, what at that time was a medium-sized seed company. They wanted to get uh, an international division started, so they asked me to run everything technical outside of the U.S. So I spent a lot of time in this country. And at that time, the company was very um, reluctant to talk about their international activities to U.S. farmers. So I pretty much fell off the radar screen um, with U.S. growers, but I learned a huge, huge amount about the different cultures and production systems, and it was a very rewarding time period for everyone except my daughter, because <laughs> I was I took an international trip every every month, which you know that means you're at least two weekends or three weekends, so September's you know all all sudden gone, um, and then um, the the company was was actually uh, trying to break away from uh, Monsanto, so they wanted to have a, a biotech department to evaluate new technologies and bring them in. And they asked me to lead that, and that was great. I had to keep myself, um, actually when I did my college work, um, molecular biology was being offered for the first time at UC Davidson in, in um, 1976 and 1975. Um, Ray Valentine was the first one, one of the early um, lead inventors in, in the field. So I had to reteach myself um, molecular biology and biochemistry and, and, uh, and all those things. And I, uh, I, I, I was pretty much a standalone person working with a bunch of uh, lawyers. So I learned how to read these four inch thick uh, contracts in, in real detail. And uh, that was a real struggle initially, but again, it's a great skill. I can go through uh, financial documents and find mistakes that other people have just passed over. Uh, I scared our, our CFO about a couple mistakes that he had copied over year after year after year. He had added a uh, number of uh, tons of soybeans sold and number of bags of uh, cotton seeds sold and, at, and added those together and went, oh, once a ton and one's 250,000 seeds. That doesn't make any sense to add add them together and report that as reporting metrics and all that. Um, so then I, that, that company was bought out and um, I spent a month looking for work, uh, networking with everyone. I had a, a friend that, that said, hey, we've got a job opening, why don't you come work for us? And um, I, once they offered me a, a job with a, a really nice pay raise above what I was getting, you know, it took about two minutes to say, great, <laughs> when can I start? And I landed with an absolute dream job for me. That's why I, I totally love it. So um, what, what Cotton Incorporated is, it's a checkoff commodity organization. All of the major crops have commodity organizations that, that handle research and promotion. Are, are you all familiar with Cotton Incorporated in, in our ads, maybe? Um, on that that has been our historic um, main objective, but behind the scenes, we've actually grown quite dramatically our research. So both agriculture <coughs> research and textile research. And the agriculture research is all done um, out of house, so to speak, and I have the, the fun pleasure of working with, with people like John Zach, and actually we're supporting uh, 280 academic and USDA labs around the US a lot of people across the street, other people at Texas Tech. And so we have, a, we have a, a just an outstandingly fun job to interact with them and try to find ways that we can use innovative science to solve uh, agriculture problems. But so I'd like to, to break this talk into uh, a little bit about why, uh, why it's great that you're doing what you're doing, a little bit about the challenges that growers uh, face and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the, you know, the areas that would be great to go into to try to solve their, their problems and how do growers make decisions, how do you interact with growers and be a natural part of that. 
So this was a, a famous diagram that you've all seen. Um, uh, you know, the citation made that time is just just through the, the roof. It's a pretty correctly environmental law. Uh, and even that citation index is just through the roof considering the time that was a follow-on later. But those three big off the planet are related to agriculture, right? Biodiversity, uh, deforestation, uh, nitrogen, agriculture is a major contributor, and phosphorus is a major contributor. So there's a huge need for your expertise um, in, in this big, big graphic. But if we look at even a, what I think is even more powerful discovery than that one, um, with these two uh, publications, we have a reader back here, a book reader. Have you read? I have not. Okay, I just read the reviews on it. Um, but the Reader's Digest version is available on that, so on PBS, there's a fantastic, in November, The Life of Camille Wilson. Um, if you haven't seen that, it's just outstanding. Um, it pretty much goes through the background of Danny Peer. His premise is that um, we are dependent upon you for fish and services. It's incredibly complex. We don't understand it all, particularly when you have the microbes and the insects and everything else uh, tied in. By the time we figure it out, it's going to be too late. So at the same time we're trying to figure it out, let's just put half of the marine environment and half of the terrestrial environment aside uh, while, we, while we sort it out so we don't go over the edge with these things. A great premise, but what does that do for agriculture? And so this other paper, uh, just a very nice discussion um, how sustainable intensification, which is a buzzword that's coming along, how that can, uh, can help to spare nature. And is your will to bring that to bear? What does that mean for us? And some of the, the, the recent papers, did, did you all see this? It was interesting to me to take this about a month ago. Did any of you see this one about the trade offs, about diets and technology uh, and deforestation? Just a really, really nice, nice paper. Um, you know, the unfortunate thing is when you grab a graphic off a PDF paper, they're just really hard to uh, display um, and understand. But basically, it, it's showing that uh, the green is where it's feasible, and uh, the other colors are where it's less feasible. And it's basically showing that uh, unless we move to a, a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet, we're either giving up massive amounts of forest. Um, uh, or else we're adopting the absolute, absolute cutting edge uh, sciences with, with agriculture. So we've got some trade offs that we have to have to think about. So this paper really goes into the depths of that. And another paper that digs into it even a little bit further on the ecosystem services. So you know we're seeing some really nice discussions about how ecosystem services and agriculture and climate change are all sort of blended. It's a, it's a fluid, fluid space. Again, this was a, a real reason to nature, nature plants. Um, you all look at, at nature plants. It's, it's been a fun new, you know, about a year old, um, but a good blend of agriculture and, and, and plant, plant sciences. Um, but this one looks at uh, a nice way to uh, understand sustainable intensification on both the, the spatial uh, scale, which is the, the, the vertical axis from the individual field to the global and, and, and the temporal from the economic efficiency um, on a, uh, for a season to the long term of agronomic sustainability and all that. And very simply looking at some of the ecosystem services that farmers are going to want to adopt because it enhances their quality of life and their profitability, such as the ones on the bottom. Uh, biocontrol, pollination services, control maintenance, but some that are not necessarily directly correlated with on-farm profitability, some in the middle. And so how that uh, prioritization um, really plays out from the standpoint of farmer, farmer adoption. So with that, let me um, talk a little bit about your impact in this space. And it's part of the reason that doing anything with agriculture can be just so rewarding, besides sitting work with farmers who really, really appreciate um, help. Um, but if you just do the simple math on impact, any 
small increases to the 1% increase, uh, once you multiply that times acres and you, and you recognize that a, a good idea out there never gets retracted in, in modern agriculture, um, you just have this huge compounding effect of, uh, of, of benefits. This is a, uh, a friend of mine who's an agronomist in, in Mexico, and not only you know, from the numbers I give you are U.S. centric, but as you know, so much of the agro's innovation that's created in Australia, in Israel, in the U.S. Um, has led to tremendous benefits uh, around around the world. And obviously, our nearest neighbors are the ones that are the most immediately in front of your picture. Um, so let me. I hope I absolutely convinced you that what you're doing is the right thing. You've really chosen a great career path. And and having agriculture as part, you don't even have to be central, but it's a part of your activities. It's just a very nice rewarding rewarding space. So let's go a little bit into the challenges that, that agricultural faces. Um, and the first one I want to dismiss with one slide, but um, it's an elephant in the room anytime you talk about sustainability. And that is the, um, the, uh, the confusion that's out there uh, the non-science component of sustainability. This actually is uh, Germany, it's in Puma's headquarters, and I had a chance to meet with their sustainability people. And um, to try to get them to think science, science, science on sustainability. So I use this slide. You all recognize what happened in that field right across from their headquarters? That was moldboard cloud. Europe still extensively mows boards plow, a technology which has largely been uh, relegated to, they've been melted down here in the US and Brazil is actually the world's leader, probably Brazil still down there and Argentina. But Europe still mold board plows uh, fairly late into the fall. There was no cover crop on this, giving up a tremendous, tremendous resource. So the discussion with them was really fun about what is sustainable and what is not. Um, a big chunk of the sustainability communication is not about science. So we're going to take that. We're just going to move that off the table from the discussion panel. I'd be glad to answer any questions on that, but it's, I think it's important to to set you know the marketing components off to the side and really drill down to the human side. So let's jump into some of the legitimate questions that farmers have and some of the challenges they face. So we're going to go through this. Sort of as a way of how cotton grows um, from a, a winter standpoint. And, um, and the first one is going to talk about surface residues. That, that field in Germany really should have a surface residue there. Plenty of moisture, uh, heat units being, uh, being wasted, um, a great opportunity. But here in West Texas, where we have very limited rainfall, growing surface residue is, is a real tough. Tough challenge. Should you use your rain to grow a surface residue? And, and uh, Dr. Zach and I are working with a grower that wrestles with this question, and he would love to have some help in trying to figure out how much of his rain should he use to grow surface residue. And he looks at uh, how much water he has in his soil bank, and he tries to anticipate that he could get four more inches this winter, so he can utilize four inches if his soil bank is full to grow a wheat crop, and he's got to grow the wheat crop at a certain point to terminate it. So these are very um, challenging questions that he faces. And he relies on his and his dad's history in that crop and in the rainfall patterns. And so climate variability, climate change, boy, that throws a monkey wrench into what they remember from 1960 to 1980 till 2010. So that the climate variability um, disruptor in the way that farmers farmers operate. Um, we go a little bit further, and, and farmers know that, that cotton roots, this is a, a little, little seed that the cotton root grows, particularly here in West Texas, where the soils tend to be generally loose and friable, uh, can penetrate a very rapid depth uh, in, a, in a short time, and that the, the ET during the summer, cotton, um, unlike corn, Stomates under open under modern stress, so it has one of the highest daily um, water uses of, uh, of, of 
that I believe Carl had. I think it was usually over and evaporation. You know, what would you get coming off the swimming pool for a little bit of, of time? And so rowers know that if, if that you're going to have that huge water suck during the, the, the July period, August period, and so you need to have that full reservoir. But here in West Texas, where we have um, limited and declining water resources, how much of that do you want to put into filling the profile, or do you want to save that water when you really need it in July? You know, really, really tough questions that, that growers, uh, growers wrestle with. In fact, when I was here as the cotton specialist in uh, the mid-1990s, the advice that we gave to growers was wrong. And um, because the data set that we were relying on wasn't as robust, and it was only recently that we had a really good robust data set that says, don't waste any of your water trying to pre-plant on irrigation, but save every last drop you can for that incredibly important July and August time period. Another uh, really tough question that growers struggle with here is that their crop has a season-long vulnerability to hail, and it can be in planting, it can be right before harvest. Um, it's, it's actually, if it's at planting time, uh, we cry a little bit, but when it's right before harvest, we really cry. It's just <laughs> devastating at that time. And oftentimes there are not insurance programs uh, to cover the ones right at harvest, which are anticipated to be in at the harvest. And, and um, growers think, are, are there things I can do to avoid it? Now that we have a little bit longer growing season, and now that we have technologies that compress it, are there ways that we can avoid it? And I know Dr. Is looking at these kind of questions. Are there windows, uh, probabilistic windows that, that help us here? But also the whole issue of whether I can replant. You know, the standard practice in, in, the, in the past uh, to make a replant decision was to, to look at it and then come back in three or four days and look at it again. <laughs> and if it wasn't making progress or wasn't making the progress we thought was adequate, it, it gets yanked out and, and fresh seed being the time. What a great opportunity for remote sensing to the drone. You really can see very precisely whether you're on track for pushing out new leaves and recovering. Some great opportunities there uh, for that. Another uh, question as we go along this season that growers struggle with, less so on the high plains here, but more where soils are sandy and they get high rainfall. This is Brazil. This is a good friend of mine, Nancy Maeda. Um, and he grew, uh, at one point he grew 25,000 hectares of cotton. And he would spend the summer um, six and a half days driving around looking at it, and then six and a half days driving around and looking at it. And I had the fun opportunity to do that for one week, one cycle with him. It's really, really neat. And he just gets out and walks, and uh, walks and, and talks. But the nitrogen, as you know, is very transitory in soils, but it's essential particularly in soils that are very, you know, oxisols like they have in, in Brazil down there. And so his question is, where is my soil nitrogen? Um, should I apply more? In fact, it's one of the things I helped him diagnose on one of his farms. He had, was suffering severe nitrogen deficiency early on in his planting. Uh, it just wasn't there. He was coming in too late with his first application. And so we talked about that and diagnosed it and, and deal. But he also worries about the flip side of nitrogen. This is the response curve of nitrogen um, with uh, large plots, all three living locations, three years with the data. So really solid data. And this is both the applied and soil reservoir nitrogen. And you can see the downside curve in terms of yield there is even steeper than the front side curve. So um, really critical is that nitrogen in your root, root zone or not. As you think to put extensive inputs on and push it over the curve. Another question that, that growers are really struggling with right now, and it's thanks to corn. God damn corn at eight dollars a bushel, seven dollars a bushel has created havoc in the southeast because growers wanted to grow corn at that price. And they knew because of uh, drought and sandy soils and apricotting, you know, some of those really nasty things. On droughted corn, so they put in massive amounts of irrigation. 
um, Mississippi Delta is now over half irrigated. I think uh, Georgia is maybe close to 40% irrigated. There's you know, incredible investments in irrigation. But how do you irrigate when you can get a full range rain over the weekend? Um, and your fields get waterlogged and the nitrogen gets leached out and then you bring in all sorts of diseases and anaerobic conditions. So the whole irrigation on, um, on these kind of uh, under high rainfall times is just a huge challenge. We can schedule irrigations in California, Arizona, really, really well. I think you can even do it in Lubbock really, really well because you don't have much water. Um, but in Georgia and the Southeast, it's a huge challenge for those guys. I interact with a group of counterparts in the Southeast, the Southeast Fire Consortium, and I really have a fun time because they represent a lot, not only the, the agriculture, but also the coastal challenges, as you can imagine, with Florida. Um, the, uh, the, the, the sea level rise. Another challenge that growers have, um, which is a unique to cotton problem, is that cotton is an indeterminate crop. And so you can keep go, 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 or you can say, you know, it's time to put some money in the bank and, and, and take my chips off the table and go home, you know, and, uh, and stop rolling the dice on it. Um, and the cotton does give you that ability. Uh, but we never know what the weather's going to be, whether that hail is going to come um, to the harvest acre or push for more bulbs at the top of plants because we've gone now to varieties that are more indeterminate. We now have um, chemical growth regulators, anti gym relics. Um, uh, Methoflot chloride is a, a very modest anti gym relic, and so you don't get the excessive growth if you push it hard with nitrogen and water. So that allows you to grow much longer in the season if you really want to, and you can get your yield in, uh, in place. And then there's another really unique cotton issue, and the cotton is a raw ancestral crop, and it has to fit just like a, a bolt or a screw um, into this very complex engine that's called textiles, and it doesn't fit if it works. You know, the, the value of cotton cellulose fuel is, is not too good. Um, and so it has to create very precise specifications for spinability. And here I show you a couple of the extremes on that. Cotton grows like a tree, but it adds new rings to the inside. So every day it adds a new ring. And you can stop its growth at any time. You don't have a very um, thick cell wall all sorts of problems with breakage and dye uptake, or you can, because it's that indeterminate crop, you can add extra bowls at the top, but that's what happens to the fibers at the bottom. They're open, they're exposed to microbes, and there's plenty of, uh, of microbes that do a great job of feeding off cellulose, and so the, the quality degrades from, from a surface standpoint. So the, um, the whole challenge of when should I harvest Quality is hugely critical uh, for cotton. Your, your price can, can be degraded to a point uh, where it's just not feasible to harvest the crop. I'll show you the next time of harvesting. It's very, very expensive in cotton. And if you don't have a crop of a certain quality, it's just not even worth harvesting at this point. So let's, let's talk a little bit about how farmers make these decisions. Because that's the, that's the really fun thing. To see what are the, the processes that they, they go through in their mind. But before, before I jump into that, are any questions on some of these challenges? Anything that, um, that you want to push back on or, or ask about? Oh, yeah. So I'm assuming when you're talking about irrigation, it's all about putting water on the land and not necessarily, and not as much pulling it off. Is that the case or not quite so much? What do you usually see, you know, like up here versus? South, like a uh, southeast Texas versus rest of the Gulf Coast. Excellent question. I uh, know you're you're totally true that um, here it's more about getting water on the field. In fact, growers have uh, have uh, installed production practices like furrow practice that actually uh, prohibits the runoff. Um, but you go to other areas where you get these really intense rainfalls, 
in a uh, drainage system are, are critical. In the cotton area, they tend to use uh, surface drainage systems, and, uh, and that, that's worked out fairly well. It's mostly new products. Uh, the Midwest, uh, Boston Sulphur, Indiana, I'm, I'm very sure from Iowa, there's always subsurface drainage, which has created all sorts of havoc you know, with the Raccoon River and, and uh, the city of Des Moines. So you know you have to by taking the water off the field, which is a, a bigger problem, but also a bigger problem for the city of Des Moines. Uh, so let me jump into if you, you can roll with me here because that, that's a that's a uh, fun part. Um, and we, we talked about many of the challenges they make, and uh, well, it's actually it's actually in the business here. You have to go right or go left. You can't just well I'll skip that decision <laughs> and put that back on the desk. Working in the office, it's just you have to procrastinate on a whole bunch of things. Um, but the crops are going to keep growing, growing, growing. You cannot procrastinate on a decision um, at all. You have to make up. So, obviously, um, looking at what's going in the field is, is, is not one historically. Now, if you think about the difficulty of doing that in either roots or soil. Um, it's extremely difficult. This is one of the few growers that I've met that actually takes, uh, walks into the field with a soil probe. That's a, that's a six foot tall soil probe. His major concern is where the moisture is. And he's, he's, a, he's a pretty tough, pretty stocky guy. And he can, he can stand on that thing or lean on it, go down six feet uh, because he's been a long term no till. Um, if there's moisture down there, if there's moisture only two feet, he goes those two feet. But honestly, he doesn't do that in too many parts of the field. But it's very common uh, on the above ground for growers just to walk and walk and walk. I've been with growers where you go in to look at the field, that's a, that's a, a mile and a half or a two mile walk. You just go all the way down one field, down and all the way back. And you get a really good sense of what's going on in the above ground. But the below ground is just not even really even with the sensor technology that we have, those are largely very contained to a very small spot. And any clever idea you have to help farmers understand what's going on below ground, that would be that would be key. Um, uh, weather forecast, obviously, they're, they're in tune to weather forecasting. Uh, they're looking at it at all the time. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can help them in in that. That would be one of the biggest gifts. Another thing that, that farmers do to help them make decisions is that a lot of them rely on, on scouts. These are people that, that we call a consultant. They go out and collect field data, and they meet with the scout who has been through this summer after summer after summer, and they do it after field after field after field for multiple growers. So they'll look at a whole bunch of crops, not just that one grower's fields, and so they can get a feel, they can get an what's going on out in the field. And historically, they've been focused on saying spray, don't spray for various uh, insects. But now that we've adopted more of an IPM approach, they're, they're, they've expanded their services to uh, uh, fertilization, to feeding, to variety selection. But having an independent source is really helpful. And also their extension service. They've done an awesome job of moving into high technology and adopting uh, things like tweets and, and email services. Hey, we saw this new problem out there. Um, it's resistant to this class of uh, pesticides. You might want to watch for these things. It's just, just a very simple type of communication that's just very, very fast. Helps farmers make those decisions that they have to make. Another way that they make uh, decisions is they're financially constrained. And this is, um, the, the cotton budget for irrigated cotton for 2016, developed by Texas A&M, um, uh, by Jackie Smith, he's the chief uh, economist at the University of Missouri. And I, I showed you some highlights for lower the crop. I think the total crop I have on there is about $140 per acre. That does not include a $30 per acre return, return 
very imaginative. So a lot of these farmers are starting the year knowing that they're going to make zero money, that they're going to spend the whole year working. Now, best case scenario is they don't lose any money, they may make zero. Um, think about the motivation. You know, that would be really tough for, for most of us uh, on that. But they need to, but they sit down with their bankers and they talk about how much money they can afford to put into various areas. And, and you can see irrigation, obviously, a huge cost. Um, and then, Jimmy, growers don't complain about that. This, the, the higher the yields, the, 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 the more the gene costs. So that in harvesting, you are not the kind of things they complain about because harvesting here in West Texas is largely a function of the current yield. Um, the uh, fertilization is the third bucket. That's a big one. Fertilization and seed, which is flat, that's a big chunk of their total budget that's got to go into ground right here. Yes? Now, you know, obviously some of these costs are inflexible. You can't yes. really change them one way or the other. Way. And I've, I've read that they're, you know, mm -hmm. so like irrigation is both the energy mm -hmm. and the grid. So where do you see them try to really control these costs the most? Like in a crop prediction, you know, if some will say, okay, well, we can only afford $800 an acre. Where do they tend to try to yeah. that out the most? Unfortunately, it's the things that they want to see. Again, you get Nick Monday. Or on a more sophisticated level, they'll say, I've spent all I can spend on, on, on insect control, and that budget is, is wiped out. So there's a lot of inflexibility in this area. Now, in terms of um, how growers can save money, the growers that have been uh, frivolous with their funds, um, they, they now have super crops. And somebody else is farming that land. Anytime you have these roller coasters of commodity prices. When you're down here for a couple of years, the non-fish growers, um, they're out. And they're, they're on other jobs, and the land is managed by the more efficient. So I firmly believe that there are not, there's not a whole lot of money to wring easily on it. Now the seed, there's a real possibility, soybean is an example, you can have generic biotech rates. And soybean has started um, through the public sector to have generic roundup ready, we think they're coming off patent, so there's some real optimism. Um, seed cost is a huge one that's grown dramatically. Um, growers have the options of non-biotech, but they like the convenience and the, the net profitability of, of transgenic. But if generics were available, they, they would definitely go for that. Um, the, fer the fertilizer, probably the greatest opportunity here for sending applications. Um, I'll show you some data later on. The adoption of grid sampling is through the roof. And so growers know that there's a whole bunch of that field does not use fertilizer and they don't have to put it on. Good, good question. Hey, um, we have a question here. Yeah. I was just wondering if you were talking more about the labor issue. Like, uh, uh, what aspect? I don't go into labor too much. Well, I'm just wondering what the yeah, no, that's an excellent point. But the labor budget is uh, is bursting here, honestly. I rolled a little bit of labor into the harvesting. Um, the nowadays, um, uh, it's it's not uncommon where you'll have a, a thousand acre um, operation here in West Texas that would be a two people. Wow. And um, now the, at, the, at the gym, you have a lot more labor, but actually running the farm. Um, so the labor requirements have gone down dramatically in uh, in U.S. agriculture. Now, outside of vegetables, and my sis, my actually my uh, my nephew is is an organic farmer in California who farms ten acres, and his labor, the sweet ham, is working on ten acres. So very very intense. But the big row crop acres here, the agriculture is is the the labor is largely off. The it's servicing equipment, designing equipment, uh, coming up with the innovations. It's, it's you all, it's Dr. Zapp, it's people like me. So the labor has moved. And the people are actually the site people that are, are pushing the button. Um, those, are, those are dramatic changes. Good, good question, I think. Uh, so another aspect of, of, of making those decisions is we're seeing farmers more and more relying on, on 
trusted website. We have really made a huge effort to uh, try to facilitate. Um, we've partnered with American Phytopathological Society, American Society of Agronomy, and the American Entomological Society. Um, they have a um, they have a website where they house webcasts, and we've learned that growers love these. In fact, the the downloads on these are um, usually 1,500 to, you know, to 2,000 for each individual one. And I just pulled out a couple because it illustrates why growers love it. When I was in extension, the model was this huge winter meeting. We tell growers everything they need to know in August. We tell that to them in January and February. Now, it's not a really good way to convey essential information. They want it when they want it. And so these two examples, these are both esoteric uh, pathogens, viruses are wiping out pathogen in India and parts of China, but they haven't invaded us here. The grower may remember what a virus infected plant might look like from the day before. So in that walking in the field, it looks down and sees something. Oh my gosh, that could be it. He now has a resource. He can go to two pages in this webinar. He can span 30 seconds and say, that looks familiar, that doesn't look familiar, and he can move on. If it looks familiar, hopefully he'll look at the whole thing, and it still looks familiar, hopefully he'll get a hold of someone and get a professional out there to look at it. They really need to be very on that. So this has been a uh, providing information exactly when they want it in a mobile format has been, been a real revolutionary. We've also got this cotton cultivator that, um, that tries to bring as much of the university information together uh, with these um, cultivated um, Google search engines have been, been really successful on that. Um, another way that farmer, uh, farmers make uh, decisions is they, they have uh, trusted friends, they have uh, experts that they, they interact with, that they, uh, they develop a relationship with. So very much, um, uh, it's a community, a neighborhood on, on the extension team. Um, and another aspect, even though it may be just a father and son that are working on that, there may be a, a, a cousin and a, 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 on, on another farm, um, and it may be that, that there will be 10 uh, land, landlords that own that property, and there may be family members uh, who are now off the farm. So many of these decisions are a family-based decision where, they, uh, where everyone that's messing sweat equity is engaged in that, that, that decision. And certainly the person that's pushing the button, he really wants that, right? You want a whole bunch of people you know, lined up saying, yeah, let's press it. Um, you know, because you never know how these things are gonna play out on that, on that culture. Um, and much of the farming, even though um, mom and dad are, may not be directly involved in the farm, they still have a 30 year history or 40 year history on that field and so they get involved in that, that discussion. It goes back to how useful is a 30-year history when it was 1940 through 1970, and now we're in 19, you know, 2016. You know, with climate variability, is that is that negative information? Is that positive information? How can we, you know, take that information today? So um, let me talk a little bit about how how you can help. That's, that's really what I, uh, I, John thinks I came in here to uh, to share some information, but really I, I came here to grab you guys and get good ideas out of you. So let me throw some things out that uh, uh, how you can help. And the number one thing is to engage farmers. They, they have huge observational skills and they learn things like way before we ever got to really see them. Uh, one of the best examples is a farmer in California, uh, the irrigation water was 11.5 decibels per meter, you know, which is off the roof. You, you would spit it out if you if you drank it. Um, very toxic in most crops. He was growing cotton with it, and um, he would plant in the bottom of a water furrow and just keep the water running over this very gravelly soil to get it through a burn. It lurched slowly, and um, he had taken a water analysis and soil analysis. And I was the extension person, that's why he called me out, was to uh, look at it. And I said, you know, I think you're a little low on some nutrients. He said, I tried fertilizer, I tried it 30 years ago, 
Some guy came out here and wanted some of some phosphorus fertilizer. Fortunately, he, uh, his rig broke down halfway through one pass. <laughs> Nothing grew in that field for three years when he put that phosphorus fertilizer out. Now, when a farmer says that, that a rig went through the field, broke down halfway, told him to get off the field, nothing grew there. That's an observation that you need to believe. Well, it turned out about 40 years after he made that observation, someone got a PhD at East California Davis for showing that phosphorus and salinity have a negative interaction. When you think about applying phosphorus to the field, it's going to be very stable there. It's going to take a while for it to be moved out, even a very gravelly, sandy soil. So the um, and I had the same example. Uh, this was a grower I was meeting with one of my board members uh, two weeks ago in Missouri, and he has this outrageously thick cover crop, John, that he's only tried for three years. He's been long-term no-till, and the cotton was just growing to beat the band. And I say, you know, the weather must have been awesome when this came out the ground because this long stems, and, and he said, no, it was the worst weather. And he said it has to do with the cover crop is forcing the cotton to get taller and get to compete for it. You know, and so he his observations were just spot on uh, with that. So the um, in, and engaging farmers is really, really easy. I wanted to throw this up because uh, Dr. Kibura is a new extension agronomist for Vernon, Texas. And um, she her ancestry is Japanese. Her studies were Wyoming and Washington, and I've had the chance to watch her uh, interact with growers, and they could care less what her ancestry is. It's all about the value that they that she brings to them, and they recognize right off the bat that she brings a huge amount of value. And even in a place that we don't think of being uh, culturally highly diverse, such as such as Vernon, Texas, it's a really successful. Uh, relationship between an extension person and a local farmer. So probably, as I mentioned earlier, one of the real things that, that farmers would love is a better weather forecast. And this is a science paper I think from last year. Um, and the slope of those lines, so that the, the top of that line is northern hemisphere, the bottom of the line is the southern hemisphere. This is weather, per, per, weather accuracy, forecast skill at its percent. And I believe that this is uh, this is rain um, on that, uh, and you can see the slope of that line is one day per decade. <laughs> We're not making a whole lot of progress in our ability to, to forecast. Um, and they, there, the article says that the big change between northern and southern hemisphere. What happened at about that time? Use of satellites. So the southern hemisphere started using satellites for weather up to the northern hemisphere. I think the limiting factors can be power. There's a lot of optimism that, that, that computational power can, can solve that. Uh, but here's the best example of why a better forecast would be key. So here is uh, Lubbock, Texas, and uh, these are long term weather records, and you've got some sort of interval bars. I think those are 75% distribution uh, around the other side. Here's Sinjan, Uramuchi, Sinjan. Look at the latitude of that. That's a major cotton growing hub, yields twice of what Lubbock are. That is halfway between the northern border of Iowa and Minneapolis. And that is a, a big, major cotton growing region in China. But look at the air bars around that. If you have my type of cheap $20 swatch watch, you look at your watch, you see the time and the date. You know what the weather is outside. The weather is highly predictable because they're downstream of the Himalayan Plateau, and so it works out beautifully for that type of farm. That's where that picture of me earlier on in China was. That's one of the military farms, the PLA, um, has the farms, and you can see they're laid out beautifully, and they're operated like a military operation. Turn the page, this is what we do. Turn the next page, this is what we do. Very, very predictable. And, they, and then uh, they use plastic. Um, so it has to do with their agronomic efficiency uh, is super, super good. Long-term sustainability is very questionable. 
because that plastic, there's two sheets of plastic. They take the top one off, the bottom one gets mixed in with the soil. And so now 20 years of mixing a layer of, of plastic into the root zone, you can imagine what that does for root growth. Um, and also, what's their water source? The treasure belt, right? It's got 20 year life cycle on it. So long term sustainability is not there, but short term, they can further improve it than that. So just to show you a little bit, and um, you know, obviously having uh, tighter um, variances in the spring is huge for a whole bunch of reasons. I, I, I think you get the idea of this, but we would love to be able to take those broad curves and, and tighten them. And we're not going to change the weather to make it more variable. I can show you another way. But if you can give growers a little bit more predictability, that is huge. Keeping money in their pockets, or they have a lot of tools, particularly a crop like cotton, with irrigation and fertilization and growth regulators to make some decisions. Or call their banker and say, you know, we got problems. Um, so that, that would be huge. Another thing that you can do is help them get ready for a gathering year. It is coming. Uh, so fast, you know, all of the big equipment that you buy from John Deere now has the connectability to measure real-time GPS, what's going on in the tractor, and that's reported to John Deere so they can say, you know, you've got a filter problem or some of there's a design problem, but the sophisticated growers are already using that to help them make decisions and capture that. It's turning into a plug-and-play, uh, give us a better crop model. Uh, and we love the ag nip concept. I, I don't think they're there. Um, uh, but Rose and Wyatt is using cotton in that because it's not as big an effort. But uh, ag nip has a promise. It's very promising. Um, uh, data sharing. And another thing that, oh, this is actually a slide I guess I should have showed you. But the little bit bottom point there, um, you know, we talked about farm scales. That not only is large in terms of acres, but it's large in terms of miles. So farmers tend to be, you know, have a farm scattered out. And so now we don't need to know what the rainfall is exactly on one field. You know, they've got, you know, one, one of my board members I talked to last week in, um, in Georgia field, he manages 100 pivots. They're scattered all over. He doesn't need to know whether the rainfall is going to occur on this pivot. You know, he wants to know are 70% of the area going to get some rain. Because that's going to help him make some of the decisions on the overall farm operation. So even a probabilistic, uh, actually it's a probability problem. Uh, the pig heating power is expanding. This is a uh, science outlook about a uh, four month uh, project. I think it's a reference if you want to write more about where you can. But we know that the productivity or the computing power is going to improve as well. Um, we also need to make precision agriculture a lot easier. This is the adoption curve based on the surveys that we do. Both of these surveys in 2008-2015 captured 10% of the U.S. cotton makers. And the bottom ones are really lagging. You can see um, yield monitors, uh, satellite imagery, centers for irrigation centers. You know, some of those have stalled at 20%. Uh, and you talk to growers, it's just not easy. And they've got so many demands on their time. Making these things so they're easy to to collect the data and easy to use the data to me is important. As part of making it easy, we also have to create um, uh, outreach programs that will encourage people to adopt new technology. I, I love these examples because you know, you look at all three of those; they're hugely successful marketing programs. That encourage people to buy something that they never thought they even knew they needed on that. Um, and, and so, marketing applying marketing, and I, I love hearing that several of you are in the sociology sphere. Um, marketing to farmers, I'm not, I don't think these are the right messages. You know, I love the one in the, in the center with the box, and it, it makes, makes you both look good. You know, it's just that's not the right message for the brain. Farmers most of them look like me. <laughs> um, uh, anything we can do on water is going to be an absolute plus. Uh, obviously, um, 
on a site specific that's the number one limitation around the world the competition for water uh, biodiversity is sort of uh, a little bit further away in terms of the capacity for farmers to water uh, capturing uh, capturing water minimizing or runoff or maximizing runoff if you have too much potential some of the irrigation how do you mix uh, four inches of irrigation in with 50 inches of rainfall? You know, what's how do you how do you balance that? Uh, stress tolerance problems, uh, soil and root health, all really really important. And here's uh, some an example again from the 2015 Natural Resource Survey. The the all the growths that irrigated, we were able to capture their water use efficiency, and a very good number. Um, for West Texas, is somewhere around 50 pounds of fiber per acre inch of applied irrigation water. So this is the added benefit you get from dry land. And you can see beehive growers down at the end are actually applying water and losing yield. Um, so helping these growers, not just the bell cow at the top end, but helping those down there, that's, that's really, really important. Um, this is something that Dr. Jack is working on. This is this is what soil in some of the toughest places to have healthy soil, the coastal plain of South Carolina, looks like when you have 28 years of corn top rotation with a no-till versus a conventional till. 28 years to get there, or we want to get there, get there faster if we can understand the microbial, uh, the microbial differences. And we're beginning to work at that, seeing some, just like John is seeing here in West Texas. See a huge increase in microbial diversity by going with that using that kind of um, and, and working with Dr. Zapp and trying to utilize this great science of, of medicine uh, with gut microbes and looking at the perfect parallels with soil microbes. And a couple of references in science do a really nice job of tracking uh, the 2012. A reference created this diagram, and I just added some of the lines at the bottom so it's really easy. But everything we're learning about the human microbiome, the gut microbiome, seems to have a parallel with what's good for a soil microbiome. Uh, so lots of options there that we're going to solve. Uh, another way that you can help is we've got to continue to push real cut. Costs don't go backwards. You saw that huge cost. Of 940 uh, prices for commodities historically been very stable in non-inflated dollars, dollars in real dollars, um, and so we've got to keep pushing yields up, not only from a profitability standpoint, but also the E.O. Wilson's half curve. If we're ever going to get there, we've just got to be willing to just invest and invest and invest in, in climate change. Um, resilience is one of the areas that uh, that growers often don't talk about, but is really, really important to them. When margins are slim, you cannot afford to have a bad year. Now you think about a developing country farmer, his margins are obviously life or death. It's not a matter of losing money, the family doesn't agree. So resilient systems, whether it's developed or developing world, and here's one of my favorite you know, wild hogs are very resilient. If they go into drought stress, they stop producing fiber and they put their resources in the sea. Uh, one of the scientists that we've brought up here, Dr. Fox, at the University of Fox, has discovered the gene that, that allows the, the sea to stop producing fiber and put all the resources in the sea. And actually, growers see that under drought stress, you get these big, healthy, Seeds, you know, like great, nice, gorgeous seeds, <laughs> but really, really lousy fiber. And that's a gene that we'd love to turn off to make the system more resilient for fiber production and not, and not seed production. So some things that we can do uh, beyond, um, uh, beyond the field scale. Um, I want to stress to you that the grower seed stress, stress tolerance as a huge priority. They do look at it a little bit based on what happened last year or what's happening right now. So this is the two surveys that we conducted with producer priorities. And again, we're getting 10% of the acres. We gave them 27 options. And in 2011, 
you can see um, a survey that was conducted uh, uh, April and May and June that had a number three out of about 30 options. It dropped a little bit this year, uh, 2015, but didn't have as much as that. But it's still really, really high on, on those lines. The main thing problems are life saving business needs and input cost. Uh, so it's a, it's a big concern for folks. Uh, and we need resilient systems for lots, lots of new that. So, so much diversity in rainfall and temperature, floral lights, that one size doesn't fit all is absolutely the mantra for for agriculture. So let me wrap up with just two concluding slides. Um, one is is the long view. We hinted at that a little bit. That farmers very much take a long view. They love their lifestyle, and they want to pass it on to their children and grandchildren. And so they recognize that the soil health, the financial health. Uh, all those things that they see intrinsic to, to that field are critical to pass it on. So they very much are in the time frame of climate change, you know, that 30, 40 year time frame out there. Um, but also they're making long term business decisions. Um, do they want to uh, relocate? Do they want to sell some land or buy some land or install irrigation or solve the huge expenses? These are some long term decisions. So very much. It's not just a day-to-day, -day, sure we have to make decisions, but we also have to have to plan for you know, a very far reaching, very far reaching future. So let me just conclude with um, one suggestion and then um, a couple other additional requests from some of our manufacturers. But in terms of farmers, I hope that I've convinced you that it's really easy to engage with farmers when you bring value. Uh, Dr. Zach got up and gave a talk through about 100 growers who went up two days, and they were they were spellbound. It was John didn't pull any punches. He put up some tough graphs, and uh, and they and they really loved it. They saw that it, the job was bringing bringing value. Um, a very good trick is to cultivate the producer leadership. You know how it is. You have one grower that is a halfway decent speaker who's well respected. He gets up and says, "This is important." It will fly, it moves. So you don't need a whole lot of growing leaders to, to move a whole bunch of political influence. Uh, it takes a year to bring specialists on that. Um, a couple of requests, help build resilience. Boy, that's a, that's a really, really tough one. Um, against some extreme events. Um, you know, we just hate to see uh, the devastation that, that, that can occur when you Events like 2011. Um, you know, whatever we can do, whether you know it's a avoiding planting or totally different production, uh, different crops. You know, we really need to to, to, to help on that. Um, I think we need to do a much better job of integrating the whole continuum of weather and climate. I apologize for being extremely sloppy with my terminology on, on that. You know, that's unfortunately that's the way a lot of agriculturalists. Think that, that, that the two really get, get blended together in this, but anything that we can do to help them incorporate that in their decision making. Um, and, and the last is boy, if we could have a 30 day forecast, wouldn't that be outstanding? You know, my farming productivity would just go through the roof if, if that would happen. So, with that, thank you very much. Thank you, John, for inviting me.